I'll turn it over to you and you can give your two cents about Mark and get us going. I don't know if I don't know if I if there's enough for two cents. It might just be a penny. All right. Well, thank you. Hey, Steve, thank you so much. I know you're sitting in, um, but you've been watching it from the side and and, you know, dent, dental intelligence, dental intel, DI. Um, some of you are, are utilize them and are advocates of dental intel. And I'm a huge advocate for those that have uh, been watching this for the last 11 months. You already know that I totally changed my software. Um, we use practice works for almost 28 years. And unfortunately, practice works and dental intel didn't work together. And I said, I need dental intel. So we it was painstaking to, to, to transfer over to Dentrix, but we did just for Dental Intel. And if you're not familiar with it, I would urge you to go on their site and see what it, what it has to offer. You know, I just checked my phone tonight. It basically gives you the opportunity to check basically the metrics in your practice that you should be watching. Mark will probably be talking some, about some of this, but you know, at the end of my day, I can go in and, and see how I did, see what patients, uh, you know, have balances or what we're going to do tomorrow. And it really makes it easy for me. So I would urge you to do that. And Steve also mentioned Utah Valley Dental Lab. Um, I've been working with them as using them for my ceramics and my implants for almost 20 years now, but I'm the director of education with them for the last four years. So we're doing all our courses. We have live patient courses and we have occlusion courses. Our next one is um, East Coast. We do one on the East Coast and one in Utah every year. East Coast, uh, Cary, North Carolina, uh, first week of December. And we do have some openings in that. But if you're interested in courses, because we still do our live patient, veneer and full mouth rehab courses, um, you can go to uvdl.com, go to upcoming events, and you can see the, see the dates. So we'd love to see you at one of those courses. Anyway, uh, without further ado, this is going to be a little deviation from our last two, which were very clinical and, and address lab communication. And I wanted to kind of think outside the box a little bit. And Mark is a tough guy to get, to get interaction with. You know, I said, how about next month. And this was like February. He goes, no, nope, I'm busy all those days. Well, how about, how about April? No, nope, I'm busy all those days. And finally we had to settle, settle for July. And I appreciate Mark and your busy schedule that uh, you're taking the time away from your friends and your family and, and going to spend a couple hours with us. And you and I have known each other 25 years. And I know that you're going to probably tell more of a history than that, but you're in for a treat. You know, Mark is an excellent clinical dentist, um, has an excellent team, um, I've seen him speak. He's funny. He's interactive. Um, so you're going to enjoy this. Um, Stephen mentioned this is our 11th one. If you want, if you didn't get to see previous ones or you want to review them, you can go on YouTube to and just look Real Talk with David Hornbrook, or you can go on the Dental Intelligence channel. Um, you can also rewatch this. So if you want your staff to watch this, you can. Again, you'll get at the end. You'll get a link to how you can watch this again. Cause this is something I'm gonna take back to my practice and, and make sure my team watches this as well. So without further ado, Mark, good to see you, man. Hey, thank you so much, Steve, appreciate you and welcome everybody <clears throat> on I hope what's a beautiful Thursday night where I'm on the East Coast for you on the West Coast, you're probably just finishing up your day. And uh, this is just really one of my favorite topics to talk about a day in the life of a Top Gun dental team. This is my, my dream team that I had for a season of my life. We'll talk about them in a minute, but I, I love what I do in dentistry. I appreciate the privilege of the podium and to be able to see and interact with Dave Hornbrook is a real treat because he is a hero of mine in dentistry. I actually think we met at the Holiday Dental Conference in Charlotte, North Carolina, like 1997 or 1492 or something. <laughs> and then one of the most impactful moments, this is kind of cool. Dave always led the league in hair and I look about 12 in this picture, um, pretty amazing. But Dave and I, and hygienist extraordinaire, Christy Minaj Burney from Maryland, who lives in California now, the three of us were the follow-up speakers to a keynote speaker at the Discus Dental Meeting in Orlando right after 9-11, so October 2001. And unfortunately, the kickoff speaker tanked. And so Dave and Christy and I were huddled together, shaking in our boots, soiling ourselves, saying, oh, God, what are we going to do? And we went to our breakout rooms, and Dave crushed it, and Christy killed it, and I was okay. And the meeting was a big success. So I appreciated that. Sincerely, it is hard to speak following McDreamy, but that's who Dave is. 
<laughs> one of the cool things in the dental seminar world is you get to meet some really cool people. People said to me, Dr. Mark, why do you want to hang out with a bunch of dentists? I'm like, in fact, the men and women that speak, if you weren't in dentistry, I would want to be their friends anyway, because the type of people who have, appreciate the privilege of the podium and put themselves out there to teach and share, it's just a really cool group of men and women. So I appreciate that. One of the coolest things about Dave Hornbrook in my life, I have never heard him put down another dentist. I've never heard him put down another organization, another institute. He's, he's a man of abundance and integrity. And I just so appreciate you having me, Dave. So when I talk, I'd love to start. One of my favorite stories is my buddy, Uncle Rich Schlentz, was talking to his 10-year-old niece, explaining to her how in Asia, trappers trap monkeys. What they'll do is they'll take a coconut, cut a hole in that coconut, it's wide enough for you to slide your hand inside. Inside that coconut, they'll place some sweets, some candies, then they'll hang the coconut from a string and wait. Soon a monkey will come along, reach his hand inside that coconut, grab those sweets, and they got him. Now, Uncle Rich was explaining this to his 10-year-old niece. He said, honey, what is it that trapped that monkey? And the 10-year-old niece said, it was the coconut. He goes, no, that wasn't it. And she said, it was the tree. He goes, no, that wasn't it either. Then the 10-year-old niece said, it was a decision. It was a decision to hold on to something that is not in your best interest. My dear friends, I'm Mark Hyman. My mission, my calling, my passion for our type of dentistry is to help the men and women of dentistry let go of that coconut, let go of those limiting beliefs, let go of those things that you would say to me, Dr. Mark, you just don't understand. It can't be done like that where I live. I'm not as handsome as Dave Hornbrook. I'm not in San Diego or Palm Beach or Palm Springs or Manhattan. Well, I was in fricking Greensboro, North Carolina, where our three biggest employers were furniture, textiles, and tobacco. How those industries done the past 20 years. They got creamed and every year I was in practice, our practice grew. Applying some of these principles that we're gonna talk about tonight. Steve, I appreciate his introduction. I am gonna show a few teeth tonight, if that's okay. As dentists, we absolutely just have to show a teeth. Part of what we're gonna talk about today, it's, it's, it's kind of cliche, but the idea of a paradigm shift, looking at your dentistry just a little bit differently, looking at how you greet your new patients, how you treat your team, how you present care, how you implement your care. We're gonna to try to see if I can give every man and woman on tonight one idea, one pearl, one verbal skill, one something that you promised me, Dr. Mark, I'm gonna take this back to my practice Monday morning and try it. And if you do that, that can make all the difference. I love this little cartoon here. This is about two choices life gives every person. Either you sit, sulk, and dwell on how unfair life is to you, or you could try and figure out how to make a bad situation work in your favor. And that's what I want you could say to me, Dr. Mark, again, you don't know how it is. You don't know what the DSOs and the PPOs and corporate dentistry, and I understand. My dear friends, you cannot be all things to all people, but you can find your niche, whatever that is, and you can knock it out of the park, I promise you. Dr. Dave, quick first visceral impression. What is this? It's like a grave to me, but I think it's a bale of hay. I like the way you're thinking both ways. Now, most dental people say it's a grave because I'm a loser, I'm about to die, my practice stinks, I can't get patients to say yes, can't find help. But you take a moment and look at it a little differently. In fact, it's just a reflection on a bale of hay. So let's look positively and let's move forward. What have we fought of late? The craziness of the past 15, 16, 18 months, the coronavirus, social distancing, uncertainty, the economy. Do we greet our patients now dressed in a mass fin snorkel and a hazmat suit? Uh, it has just been kind of nuts to what's going on in the world. A big thing for me is your first experience, your first contact with your patients. And I love this picture. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, quoting our friends from Star Wars, we used to actually greet our patients face to face unmasked, right? And then we got these little dinky pieces of plastic as if that did anything to a lethal virus. And then we shrink wrapped our practices. And now dentistry is, I think, returning to a humanistic practice. My friends, my contention tonight is what got you here today won't get you there tomorrow. So I want everybody to kick your shoes off and just have a good time tonight participate. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. I'm going to ask Dr. Dave to join us as well. And we're just going to have a great time. This is Uncle Rich, my buddy, <clears throat> who was one of my Dale Carnegie instructors and a speaking coach. And he's absolutely a sensational, mesmerizing communicator. I've had Rich work with about a half dozen men and women in dentistry and have really kickstarted their speaking career. 
Rich came and did a little lunch and learn from my team. And he said, man, this is an extraordinary dental practice. What makes it so? And then my team write every characteristic about our practice, put it on a sticky note and throw it on the wall. And he collated all of those. And he came up with five main factors that you could, to show that you have an extraordinary dental practice. I know what Dave is thinking right now. <laughs> Dr. Mark, look at number eight, man. Look at that black triangle. What is interesting is that after Rich did that consult in my practice, he said, you know, I need to switch to your practice. I said, great. And I saw this. Dave, what is the first visceral gut impression? What's the first thing you're going to say to Rich? How'd you chip your front tooth? Somebody hit you that tooth with an ugly stick, right? <laughs> and most of the men and women in dentistry will start saying, well, you need bonding. You need whitening. You need a crown. You need veneer. You need an ortho to close that black triangle. And my contention is nobody needs anything that we're doing. Nobody has to have that fixed. What I want to try to guide you tonight is to ask the right questions. Patients ask you a question, you answer with another question. I said, Rich, how does that front tooth make you feel? What you smile for pictures, how does that make you feel? And he said to me, my wife thinks I'm sexy. And I said, thank you very much. So we didn't touch the front tooth. You look at that and immediately you know technically how to solve it, but you don't know what he values yet. So Rich said there's five characteristics of superstar dental organizations. And number one is to have the right team. Now I graduated UNC Chapel Hill uh, for dental school in December, 1983. They don't let you do that anymore. I finished six months early, went to the Holy Land of Israel and worked as a volunteer dentist. We'll talk about that. Did a two year hospital residency. And then I bought basically a bankrupt practice in Greensboro, North Carolina. I started July 1st, 1986. The receptionist quit six weeks after I started. I fired the chain smoking hygienist and I had one employee left. Don't you just love it when that happens? Then the good Lord smiled upon me because I went to a Linda Miles seminar and heard Linda speak. Dave, you've heard Linda many oh, yeah. times, I'm I love sure. Her. The grand dame of practice management leadership. And I think she looked at me, some pathetic character from some Oliver Twist novel. Please, sir, may I have some more? I said, Linda, I bought this practice. I don't know what I'm doing. She said, poor child, let's have lunch. And she listened to me whine and moan and complain and said, why don't you do this, that, this, that, give me five little ideas. Next month, the practice doubled and then doubled and then doubled. So God bless Linda Miles, Dr. Kathy Jamison, my coach and hero. A lot of people put so much into me, but the woman on the left with the big necklace, Susan, was the one teammate that remained. She was my first dental assistant. She only stayed with me eight and a half years. Cheryl with the glasses in the middle was my first hygienist. She said, I'll work for you for two weeks. She stayed 14 and a half years. And Gina on the right was with me five and a half years before she had a baby and went back to California. But that was my first team. You look at it and you say, Dr. Mark, I could never be Dave Hornbrook. I could never be, never be Billy Dorfman. You know, Dave and Billy didn't start their practices like that. I'd started out looking like this, which is kind of pathetic. And, um, but it was kind of cool when we could have a team meeting in my car when I had one receptionist, one assistant, one hygienist, we were cranking and the practice was rocking and rolling and it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> then I did have a season of the dream team. These women gave me such love and loyalty. It's simply unbelievable from the top left, Betty with her arm on the side was with me 15 years. Mary Catherine with the glasses was with me 25 years. Carla Jean in the middle was 15 years. Redhead on the, on, on the end, Athena Escovedo Calloway, my lead dental assistant for 19 years, the front row, Lauren 12, Laney 15, Patty 15. We went on more than a decade, essentially with no turnover. And that was just the magical season of my practice career. And I so appreciated that time. Then I did sell my practice to Dr. Steve Hatcher, Dr. Sona Ishirani, husband, wife team. They were students of mine at UNC Adams School of Dentistry in Chapel Hill. So I started in private practice. I was down to one employee, grew to three, and I left there with 17. Dave, would you agree bigger's not always better? Not always. Better's always better. Better's always better. Write that down, young men and women on this call. Those are sagely words. So that's kind of cool. For me, for the men and women on the call tonight, the idea, if I asked you, how do you lead? What type of leader are you in the practice? To me, if you are leading and no one is following, you are just taking a walk. So there are different ways to lead in dentistry. I remember a student of mine said, Dr. Mark, I'm going to rule my team with an iron fist. And I said, Mazel Tov, I'm happy for you. You're going to lead by yourself, Yertle the Turtle. No one's going to want to work with you if you're like that. This is kind of a cool shot. This is our Abbey Road moment. Dave, when I teach my students, now, I've got to explain to them what Abbey Road is. <laughs> but that's kind of cool. It gets a little creepy if you look the third 
teammate on the left has got my head cut off there. But where's <laughs> Dr. Mark in this picture? I'm in the back. Is that how we lead, Dave? Sometimes. Sometimes we gather the team and say, we're crossing the street, left foot forward, ready, break, and off they go. They didn't need me to say, let me show you how to put your left leg forward, then your right, then your left. So I want you, doctors, I want you to focus on CEO doctor only stuff and train your team and get out of their way and let them let your practice rock. If you try to micromanage everything, you're wasting your time. I want you to focus on what only you can do. Dave, you look at this picture, you know why some animals eat their young, right? This is me working as a dentist in Israel. That's kind of tragic. I was 25 years old. If you look at this picture, this is 1984. How has dentistry changed? You remember the, day, the days, Dave, no gloves, no masks, fins, and snorkels. Patients not wearing safety glasses. That's the way we worked. And I got back four months later after volunteering in Israel and HIV, AIDS had hit America and everybody was wearing gloves and masks. So that changed a bunch. So this was my first practice. Again, when you look at a speaker and say, you must have it going on, you just had it easy. This is a 1950s dental building. It had, we had three operatories when I started. There was a couch in there with a rip in the middle of it. You look at these steps going up. If my senior citizen could get their way up the steps without having a heart attack, I knew I could work on them. But this tree on the right would bloom one week out of the year. It's the prettiest thing you ever saw. The story in my life, I had a photographer coming out to take photos of my practice, and the landlord had this tree on the left pruned. But if you've been to a Mark Hyman seminar, you learn to take lemons and make lemonade, right? So there's a woman dentist that accepted capitation PPO HMO plans on the left. So that tree on the left is a capitation dental tree. The tree on the right is the private practice fee for service, men and women who've studied with Dave Hornbrook. Does that look a little bit better to you? I hope you say the answer is yes. So here I am my first week in private practice, styling and profiling, short shorts, polyester curtain, dead plant. Man, you know you're hurting for credibility. You put your freaking dental school picture on the wall. But I was so happy. I was so happy, man. And then things rocked on. And after 19 years of private practice, I got fired. After 19 years of private practice, my partnership broke apart and I had to leave and move in here. This was a former Green Valley psychiatry office. Dave said, Mark, that's befitting of you. It wasn't for sale, so I bought it. Now, my dear friends, give me your first visceral gut reaction when you walk into Dr. Mark's new office. Is that a little different? I want you to think about the packaging of your product. If you look at the extraordinary dentistry that Dr. Dave Hornbrook does, I guarantee you in his office, there isn't shag carpet, right? Grass cloth on the walls, mirrors on the ceiling. Maybe, maybe it is. You know, does this imply excellence and attention to detail and quality? So I don't care what type of dentistry you choose to practice, friends, but the packaging, your marketing, the message has to match the quality and the experience that the patients have in your practice. Does that make sense? I hope the answer is yes to you. So my office was on Oak Crest Avenue in Greensboro, North Carolina. It's subtitled Drill Hill. It's a one block area in Greensboro that has 20 some dental offices on it. Dentists are like lemmings. One went there and everybody followed. If you look at a map of Greensboro, North Carolina, the two wealthiest subdivisions are bisected by Oak Crest Avenue. So all the dentists set their office up there. So I want you to tell me what's the common theme, common thread of the parking lot, 7 a.m. Monday morning on Drill Hill. That's my office. To the left is four endodontists and a pediatric dentist, the, the gray building straight ahead. Seven endodontists and a periodontist. Here's my oral surgeon, plastic surgeon. Here's two general dentists here. Behind them are two orthodontists and across the street are five general dentists, including the past president of the American Dental Association, Dr. Chuck Norman. What is the common theme, common thread of the parking lot, 7 a.m. on Oak Crest? Dr. Dave, what are you seeing? 7 a.m. I'm not seeing many cars, that's for sure. How many, how many cars do you see? <laughs> that's probably yours. That would be my car, why? Because <laughs> I'm a madman, because I'm the cheese, I'm a kahuna. And I follow this high-minded leadership management principle called MBWA. Who remembers that? MBWA, management by wandering around. I'm the first one in the office and I turn on the lights, turn on the AC, check is the carpet clean, 
Has the trash cans been emptied? Are light bulbs burned out? Are the magazine straight? Have the plants been watered? Turn on the music, turn on the autoclave. As the team comes in, Dr. Mark is there. That is my way to lead. And I'll usually ask colleagues of mine, Dr. Dave, you tell me, usually start at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. We start at 6.45. 6.45, you tell me, is it okay to walk in at 7.15 for a 6.45 patient smoking a doobie saying, are y'all working hard? <laughs> It's California. He can do what he wants. Yeah, he pretty much do it. This, of course. This, this is your choice, friends. <laughs> it's your choice how you're going to leave. I was always the first one there and the last to leave. And that meant a lot to me. Here's a little pearl for you to take back to your practice. If you haven't seen this video, it takes five minutes. At 211 degrees, water is hot. You add one degree, the difference of 211 to 212, it's one degree difference. But then at 211 to 212, at 212 degrees, water is boiling. Boiling water creates steam, steam can power a locomotive engine. So if you show this to your team, my suggestion next week is bring in turkey sandwiches at lunchtime and watch this video with your team and challenge them. Will you give me one degree, 1%? 1 Will every one of you during our eight hours together find one thing to stretch, to improve, to do just a little bit better? Now the power, the synergy of that, the one plus one equaling three is unbelievable. The idea of stretching just a little bit more, a little higher and a little bit higher still, it's amazing what can happen. So I challenged my team, will you give me one degree, 1%? One they said yes. The next day to an already crushed busy schedule, my team added an extra $4,000. Does that work for anybody? Now on average, my team would add at least $2,000 a day to our practice. The average dentist works 200 days a year. Let's make it simple. Anybody like a $100,000 increase in the next 12 months? $200,000 increase in the next 12 months? It's as simple as stretching just a little bit, is engaging and empowering and training the team to do that. And when your team stretches like that, that day we added four grand, five o'clock, I said a quick team meeting and the team was like, oh, we get to meet again. This huddle was a little different. Dave, I'm sure you've done this mm -hmm. when you break out the Benjamins. And I didn't say the bottom left, Meredith, what did you do? I said, Meredith, what'd you see Tiffany do? Tiffany cleaned my room when I was behind. Bang, gave her a hundred. Tiff, what'd you see Lainey do? Lainey took my full series when I was behind. Boom, gave her a hundred. And I went around and didn't say, what did you do? What'd you see the team do right? So much of American leadership is critical. Let me tell you the three things you screwed up today. Instead of the 97, you did well. So that was my philosophy as a manager, as the leader, as the inspiration for the team, as the liberation for the team to say, I trust you all. People have said to me, Dr. Mark, you just got lucky. You got to hire all these great teammates. Every woman in this picture used to work for another dentist and then came to work for me and stayed. So think about the power of that. Shocker, Dave, I'm a Tar Heel. I'm a quadruple Tar Heel undergrad dental school residency. Now I'm an adjunct full professor and special assistant to the office of the Dean at the UNC Adams School of Dentistry. Any of my Tar Heels on tonight, love you guys. Bottom left coach, Dean Smith. It was, and his day was the winningest college basketball coach of all time. My whole life, I wanted to play basketball for coach Smith. It's a challenge when you're six feet tall Jewish with a two inch vertical jump, you're probably not going to play college hoops. But what Coach Smith did is this is he instituted this. It's called you point to the assist man or woman <clears throat> and say thank you. Because without the ball, you cannot score. Dave, you seen a basketball game, somebody scores and points. Have you noticed that? Oh yeah. Yeah. So Coach Smith started the other, that the other night with the Bucks. <laughs> yep. God bless them. They run, they ran the table. They yeah. were down and rocked. Coach Smith started that because he wanted the emphasis to be on who made the pass, not who did the Yamama slam dunk. So how cool would it be if every practice represented here tonight? made that commitment right here, right now to point to the assist man or woman and say, thank you. To catch your, catch your teammates doing things right instead of doing things wrong. It's a glorious way to practice. That's Coach Williams who just retired with three national championships. We appreciate you coach and life is moving on. So business team superstars, again, I adored these folks. They gave me again, such love and loyalty combined. They worked, for, I worked for them for almost 45 years. They were amazing. One of the greatest gifts that I could give them is an automated patient confirmation system. There are wonderful systems available as we discussed. Dental Ill Intel is a sponsor. We appreciate them. I'm not here hawking any product, any product that I mentioned, I pay for. So it's wonderful when you can get your schedule right in front of you. You can see your production the day before, today, 
Tomorrow you can send texts to your patients, feel good notes, five-star reviews. That seems that is the rage. When I left private practice, I had over 1,200 five-star reviews. I've had people say, Dr. Mark, you must have paid for them. No, I didn't. I asked. Now we got cosmetic dental expert, Dr. Dave Hornbrook here. Dave, I'm guessing five-star reviews, you must have a wheelbarrow full, am I right? <laughs> not as many as you did. Oh, well, not yet. After tonight, we're going to work on that. When's a good time to ask for a five-star review? Is it right when you meet somebody or when you're finished? What do you think? I don't know, you tell us. Two ways to look at it. My opinion may be contrarian. Right up front is when I want you to ask. Particularly if I ask, how'd you find out about it? Somebody said, I want to align you. I had all these five-star reviews. I'd say, well, thank you so much. Will you do me a favor? If anything about this visit isn't five-star, would you please tell me right away? And if this is the most unbelievable dental visit you ever had in your life, would you honor me and go online for two seconds and share this? So that's two things I ask is, would you give me a five-star review? I challenge them right up front. Catch me with anything that isn't five-star. And secondly, I'll say, would you pick one person in your life, family member, coworker, and tell them about our practice? I don't want them to send a thousand people, but I want them to pick one person that you think would appreciate what we're doing here. It's a great way to build your practice. Our dental assisting superstars, again, they just absolutely rock the house. In North Carolina, we have a dental anesthesiologist that will come in and intubate your patient. I'm on staff at three hospitals and two surgical centers because of my hospital residency. But towards the end of my career, it was such a hassle to go to the hospital. And dental anesthesiologist would come in and sedate your patient in your office. Dave, have you ever done that? I've only done it once. Did it, did it work well for you? It did. You know, the type of dentistry I do, it's, it's kind of difficult because they're you know, it's difficult as all get great, out, man. And they got to see their smile, right? But yeah. It, it, it's an opportunity for a gagger, for a phobic that wants the type of care that you have to offer, but doesn't think they can get it. So why I love this picture is where's Dr. Mark here? The assistants are running the case. I'm out back with Dr. Dave hanging, right? So that's the difference. I love training the team and get adding out of their way. Your teammates, your assistants, doctors can run the case. They can design the CAD CAM restorations. They can use the intro cam camera, floss, polish, fluoride, post-op instructions, get comfortable financial arrangements, apply for care credit. My assistant did so much more than just sit in their chair side. It made a huge difference. Our assistants call our hygienists our hyenas or our hygienists and our hygienists call themselves our hygienists, which is what they are. They were so smart and so talented and spirited. And uh, I just I adore them and appreciate them. Key question for hygienists. Christy, if you can type in here, I would appreciate it. If a cavicide wipe falls on the floor, is it dirty or does it clean itself? <laughs> Dave, you cannot imagine the responses I get, hygienists start throwing stuff at me during a seminar. I'm like, you can't do that. I'm like, it's a joke. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I guess it depends Products. on whether it fell on a clean part of the floor, right? I just, you know, it, it is one of those philosophic conundrums. So moving forward, Dave, with your gorgeous cosmetic work, do you suggest power toothbrushes to maintain them? Absolutely. Tremendous. And here's just a working thought. I'm a huge Phillips fan whether it's for the whitening, the day white, night white, the zooming, the power toothbrush, the Sonicare's, Oral-B, Braun, Procter & Gamble, wonderful products in dentistry. I'm not here hawking anybody beyond. They're two of the best of the best. I think I would ask if I could speak to the audience, hygienists, can your patients clean as well with a handheld manual toothbrush as they can a power toothbrush? The answer is obvious, isn't it? So when we do some gorgeous dentistry, my thought for the next 12 scaling root planing patients, why don't you buy a dozen power toothbrushes, add a hundred bucks to your scaling root plane and give them the dang brush. Does that make sense? I have people say, oh, I, don't, I can't compete with Costco. I don't, want to, I don't want to deal with returns. I don't want to deal with sales tax. I just think basically they're coming to us as the experts for their oral health. So if you say you just invested 20, 30, $40,000 in this smile, let's protect it with this power toothbrush. It's, it's just a lovely courtesy. The link of gum disease, heart disease, healthy mouth, healthy body. Our young men and women on the call tonight, you may not realize how fortunate you are that people value now what we're doing in dentistry. Because patients may come to you like Dale who say, Dr. Mark, I got a problem. 
Dr. Dave, tell me what your treatment plan would be here. <laughs> now, usually I get one of four responses from this. Usually the business team members in the audience are on the floor hurling. The dental assistants are so sweet that they say, Dr. Mark, at least she flosses. Look at the gaps there. Now, Dr. Dave Hornbrook would teach you how to use the finest diamond and to prep those into veneers, right? Yeah, these might Hi, be Janice, what are you thinking? <laughs> Hi, Janice, what are you thinking? You're thinking, give me a Cavatron, baby. Look at that tartar for days, man. So it was like a WWF cage match broke out of my office. The hygienists are pummeling each other for turns getting the cava bomb these teeth off. Dave, with the privilege that you and I have to do our type of dentistry, do we change people's lives, yes or no? Oh, absolutely, every day. There's your before. Then somebody goes to Dave Hornbrook and here's the after. <laughs> Life is good, am I right? It is good. So that's what's possible. And that's a way to kind of lighten up on yourself and also have a lot of fun. Another little pearl for your practice as Donnie Bauer, Donnie Bauer Massage. For over 20 years, he came to my practice Wednesdays at lunchtime, did head and neck back massage for the team. I cannot tell you the impact of me telling my team because I love you, I care about you. Ergonomically, I need you healthy. I want you to know I'm going to do everything possible to back you up and protect you. Here's stupid doctor trick 101. There was a colleague of mine in Greensboro who would have Donnie in for massages and he would dock the teammates pay per massage that Donnie did. I mean, if that isn't 50 shades of stupid, it's like, come on, man. So these are little tiny things. You could say to me, Dr. Mark, what, what's that? Does that really make a difference? When I had teammates that stayed with me 25 years, 19 years, 15, 15, 14, 14, you tell me, are you being the type of boss that your teammates adore you? Are you giving them a reason to stay during turbulent times? I understand nationwide there is a staffing challenge in dentistry for some teammates, men and women who chose not to come back to the workforce, others who have chosen to go work other places because of compensation. And I just think when you spoil your team, like I tried to spoil my gang, there's, I, I don't worry about them going anywhere else. For the men and women on the call tonight, is this proper operator position, yes or no? The fact is sometimes you just gotta take one for the team, right? This is Lainey, my superstar hygienist. She had a senior in the chair, couldn't get comfortable, head under his pillow, head under his tush. Finally, Lainey's in his lap, scaling root planning. I come in to check him. He looks up and says, can I have a cigarette? You know, can I come back tomorrow? It's just kind of creepy, but you do what you got to do to get the job done, right? Dr. Dave, have you ever seen one of your teammates use an armpit during a procedure? I don't think so. You just have to go, really? I mean, the worst thing I could say to my team is not tell them where to go, but to say, don't move, I'm getting my camera. And they're like, oh no, I just made the seminar. I'm like, yes, you did. <laughs> Dave, have you ever made one of these extended reservoir whitening trays? Yeah, actually I have. I just think it's a riot. And the only people I know that would be happy with that slide is Phillips. How much day white, night white would you need to fill that tray? So just kind of crazy, but that's the thing. So the number one thing Uncle Rich said, if you want to have a Top Gun superstar dental practice, you got to get the right team. Collins book, Good to Great, said you get the right people on the bus, the right people on the bus in the right seat. Number two issue is communication. We used to say in our practice, communication is a wonderful thing. We should try it sometimes because we tried. Dave, where is this? <laughs> it's the Canadian view of Mount back Rushmore, back, right? right? It's the Canadian view of Mount Rushmore. Now, my sense of geography is not very good. Do we all see the world the same way? Of course we don't. And again, you may say to me, well, you guys that had the privilege of the podium and you got these fancy practices and these fancy offices, patients come in and say yes to you left and right. Dr. Dave, you ever have somebody say no to you? Yeah, not, not very often. I would bet it's, not I bet it's unusual. It, it yeah, is. because they're pretty well preheated. The fact is my dear friends is business is nothing but relationships. If the first thing you try to do to me is tell me what's wrong with me, and list my problems, you're gonna lose me. So this was sent by a dear friend. She said, Ms. My, should my BFF get six or eight veneers? So we got cosmetic dental expert, Dave Hornbrook here. Let's get Dave's opinion. I know what his opinion's gonna be, which is that's not the question. The question is what are her goals for her health, teeth and smile? Does she just want six veneers? 
She's missing number 11. You look at the gingival tissue. Cosmetic dentistry isn't just veneering teeth. It's looking at a whole lot of factors. And if you just don't even know where to start, you can take a nice picture and just start drawing some lines. Is the midline lined up? You look, if you believe that the crest height of the tissue, six, eight, nine, <clears> and 11 are supposed to be roughly the same. You can just start to work your way through that. The incisal ledges, Dave, you say six, eight, nine, and 11 generally kiss off the same plane, roughly. Do you agree with me? Yeah. So this is a way for you, if you don't know where to start with cosmetics, to say, well, let me just take some pictures and work my way through it. This is the big seven that we tried to deal with. I think I learned this from Dave. Mm -hmm. That's my list. He probably has more than seven. <laughs> so incisal ledge position, is it correct or not? What's the smile line? The incisal ledge inclination, are they procline bucked out? Are they class two D2 sucked in? Is the midline correct? Is the profile pleasing? The buccal corridors, you go anterior, posterior. Is it full and are the gingival architecture, is it appropriate? So if you don't know where to start, write the big seven down. I would love for you to take a screenshot of that or write that down. Meet with your team next week and say, let's just look at 10, slot, 10 smiles and you all tell me what you see. Let's start to build some institutional knowledge in our practice. It can't just be the doctor talking about this. This young man came to see me, he was a senior in college. A colleague of mine said he wanted to crown his front six teeth. And I'm like, wow, that is certainly a possible treatment plan, but so is this. If you take this smile, just lighten his teeth. I wonder with a golden proportion, Dave, could I get a gorgeous cosmetic result just veneering eight and nine? What do you think, Yoda Master? Yeah, I think it looks great. I, for a 21 year old, I think a word that I will use to my dying day with your friends is appropriate. Was this the appropriate treatment? Was this appropriate for this young man at this time in his life? I think the answer is yes. The idea of a morning meeting, morning huddle, Dave, it still kills me. How many offices don't huddle, don't meet, don't communicate? You, you could have a morning huddle or an evening huddle, doesn't matter to me, but I think it's imperative. As my team grew, as, when I, as I shared with you, when I left private practice, there's 17 teammates. This is the one 10 minute time increment that the entire team is together and then boom, we're off to the races and we're never all back together the rest of the day. So I've sat in a lot of huddles that were very inefficient and ineffective. So what Jameson management taught me is basically your hygienist, you just present opportunity. I don't want you to read, Mrs. Smith at eight o'clock is coming in for a cleaning, Mrs. Jones at nine. You think we can all read. How about eight o'clock, Ms. Smith has a watch on 3031. I see the nine o'clock restorative patient just canceled. Can we get her to stay? Nine o'clock, Ms. Jones is coming and she concerned she wants to whiten her teeth, but then she's got a wedding coming up and then she broke a tooth and then she went to endo and she went and got crown line thing. We never whitened her teeth. Who can grab a scan? Who can grab a couple of alginates? So hygienist, just what's your opportunity of undone dentistry? Our blessed dental assistants, Dr. Dave is gonna prep 10 veneers at 10 o'clock and cement 10 veneers at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Dave, can you be in two rooms at the same time? Not, not very efficiently. You can't do it efficiently and effectively for the quality of dentistry that you deliver. You can't be doing aerobic dentistry, bouncing from room to room and back and forth and back and forth. So I just want my assistant to look at their day and say, wowzer, look at two o'clock. We got a roadblock here. We need to tweak the schedule. And then our business team members would say, here's where we were yesterday. Here we are today if we're at our daily goal, production, collection, new patients. And then finally, where are we tomorrow? If they say Dr. Wonderful has an opening from 10 to 12, who's supposed to fill that? It's everybody, it's all of us, it's not just the business team. So if you all trust me and support that concept to go from 211 to 212, the one degree, 1% 1 differences, if every one of these seven teammates improve the practice just a little bit per day, look what happens to your office, mm -hmm. things go nuts. Dave, this was one of the proudest moments for me. It was lunchtime, I was just walking down the hall and the group of four hygienists had huddled. They were doing their own departmental meeting. They didn't ask the doctor's permission. They didn't say, Dr. Dave, if we meet at lunch, will you pay us? They just said, we got a job to do and we're not, our department's off sync. Grab your lunches, let's huddle up and let's solve it. So I loved these women. I loved that they felt so empowered and invested and engaged and they felt ownership in the practice. So that was pretty amazing. Yeah, Dave, yeah, Mark, I had eight interrupt you here. So, I, so, you know, as a leader, I think the most important thing you can do is to empower your team, right? 
Absolutely. You just said that. And I think it's so important to empower them. And it's just like your Abbey Road picture. You empower them to find their way to the other side of the road, right? And you're never necessarily out of control, right? If they would have made a right and went down the center of the road, you may have said, hey, ladies, you know, keep going straight. But you allow them to make that decision. And I think too many dentists or micromanagers, they come in and they want to do every little thing and, and their team is like, well, I'll just wait till he or she tells me to do something versus take initiative because they are in power. Dave, you, you can practice that way. It's legal, but it's a shame because I think the joy of our type of dentistry is you really sculpt your practice to exactly what your dream is. You do what is doctor only CEO work all day long and you have your magnificent team do all the other stuff. And then everybody's working to their maximum capacity and everybody wins. Dave, we had eight operatories in my practice, eight operatories of ADEC equipment. This was the highest producing room Every new patient, every emergency patient would come and sit and we would talk. Treatment coordinator, my, the patient, and Dr. Wonderful. And here's a list of the next two slides if you want to take a screenshot of this gang or use your cell phone and take a picture. These are 10 questions. If you don't have a system, I'm amazed when I meet young dentists. I say, well, I'm your new patient. What are you going to say? Tell me, what are your questions? Walk me through the new patient. And they're like, uh, do, uh, uh, do you have insurance? I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how we're going to do it. So this is a suggested sequence that you could walk through. I used to say, do you have any trouble finding your office with Google Maps? That's kind of a stupid question now. I'd say, who can we thank for referring you? There's a big distinction, friends, if they say, you signed up for my PPO, you have to see me, versus Dr. Dave Hornbrook said, you, you got to go see Dr. Mark. He's the best. So how preheated are they? Also, who can I thank for referring you in Plants to Seed? We're taking new patients. Then the five magic words, gang, how can I help you? The patient says, I hate my smile. The temptation is to say, well, that's because you have a Vita shade A17, class 2 D2 laterals, diastomata between eight and nine, and your mom addressed you funny. Don't do that to people. How can I help you? I hate my smile. Answer that with, tell me more. What do you hate about your smile? Is it color, size, shape? Walk me through it. I hate my teeth, the size, color, size, shape. How does that make you feel? I don't smile for pictures. Do you have pictures coming up? What did your last dentist tell you? That's a huge question. These next two questions, I find our colleagues don't ask this. And these are the keys to getting to yes. What'd your last dentist tell you? I have so many people say, why'd you leave your last dentist? He was always pushing crowns. I love hearing that because I'd say, do you think you need one? And almost always they'd say, I don't know. <laughs> and I'd say, sir, madam, if I see changes going on in your mouth, do I have your permission to tell you? And once they say, yes, it's up a time. It's a great time to be a dentist. Why now? Why'd you come in today versus next week versus next month? What's the urgency to act? Why'd you come in? What are your long-term goals for your health, teeth, and smile? I'd say, ma'am, I'm not being smart with you, but do you want to keep your teeth the rest of your life? It's a facetious question, but people say, of course I do. And I'll say, so... Do I have your permission to tell you what I see? One of the great things Kathy Jamison taught me is said, with your permission, I'll do the most thorough exam, complete, careful exam you ever had in your life. I'll study your pictures and x-rays and give you a roadmap to get exactly what you said you wanted. If you give me permission to do that, you have my permission to do some of it, all of it, or none of it. It's a very liberating statement. If I have your permission to do the best exam you ever had, then you've got my permission to say yes to everything I say, to some of it, all of it, none of it. Who else has input? My wife is a nurse. All family health care goes through her. My point with that is who is the decision maker in the family? Dave, you ever present a treatment plan and somebody says, I've got to go ask my husband, my wife, my accountant, milkman's cousin, rabbi's neighbor's priest. Mm -hmm. It's like we have excusitis in dentistry. I'm just saying, am I presenting my treatment to the decision maker in the family? Do you have a budget out of patients say, Dr. Mark, I want a beautiful white smile. I got 500 bucks. I'm like, here's, here's a Sonicare and a tube of day white. Good luck. <laughs> I had someone say, money's a big deal. I only have 20 or 30,000 to solve this. I'm like, we can do that. When would you like to be finished? Here's a statement if that speaks to you, friends. When I, I did a webinar for Jameson Management, I was interviewed. They put this on Facebook. So if it's on Facebook, it must be true. 
They said, I said, when I stopped telling people what they needed and started listening to what they wanted, everything changed. If that speaks to you, my dear friends, stop telling your patients what they need and listen carefully and ask them what do they want and give it to them. It is a paradigm shift that can be really cool. So if you go to a Dave Hornbrook or a lesser extent me, basically somebody's come, Dave, this is a single mom, third grade teacher, doesn't have the benefit of dental insurance. She have any interest in keeping her teeth, yes or no? I would think so. Yeah. To my dying day, I'll say, how do you know if you don't ask? I have studied with Dave Hornbrook for years. You know what he taught me is how to turn this smile in two visits Boom, into that. What do you think? Good job. It's not even the same patient. Wake up, everybody. Come on. Let's do a real case. So you may say, well, you guys, all you do is 28 veneers on everybody. We have the privilege of that sometimes. And sometimes we're doing white bread dentistry too. So this is a single mom, a third grade teacher who doesn't have the benefit of dental insurance. She's been to a colleague of ours in Greensboro who just placed on tooth number eight, a brand new toenail. Dr. Dave, is this the finest we can do in dentistry today? Obviously, it is for, for somebody. <laughs> for some, some people, I, God bless them. For this, I am not for this one person, colleagues. maybe, right? <laughs> it may well have been. I promise you they haven't studied with Dr. Dave. So the ticket to me is you ask the right questions. You look at the big seven. You go through the process. You ask her, Dr. Mark's 10 questions. What are your goals for your health, teeth, and smile? She said, I hate my smile. Tell me more. This is a brand new tooth. How does it make you feel? It looks terrible. And we were off to the races. This is from the internet. It's the golden proportion. If you aren't hip to this yet, gang, Google this. Meet with your team with turkey sandwiches next week. Have 20 slide, 20 different smiles with this picture. And have your team over and over and over again visualize what's ideal and what are changes that could be done to this smile. The proportionality mesial distal of the centrals of 1.6, the laterals 1.0, the mesial half of the canines before the canines curve around the arch, 0.6. If that speaks to you, gang, it's amazing. Then when you look at smiles and you can say to Julie, yes or no, can I just recrown number eight by itself and give her a gorgeous smile? The answer is there's no way. In size or gingival length of that toenail, you can't just recrown that tooth. So what's appropriate? Comfortable financials from our financial partner, Care Credit, makes all the difference in the world. One year, we, my practice put over $400,000 on Care Credit. People said to me, Dr. Mark, look at all that money you just lost. Okay, it was $400,000. You only got paid three hundred and sixty. You lost $40,000. Or I got paid three hundred and sixty dollars that maybe I wouldn't have got. So what's the right thing for a single mom without dental insurance? Put her the teeth in the right position. Dave, I know you deal with this all the time. The idea, long-term stability, if you can move the teeth orthodontically to a healthier position, isn't that best? Yeah, Stable, so comfortable jaw joints, proper occlusion, healthy tissue. You can't always do it. Then we're going to take off the toenail on number eight, do a gingival graft, change the composite on seven, and lighten your teeth. So there's your before. There's your after. That's the year 2001. Is that a little bit better, Dave? A lot better. There's a four-year follow-up. How are we doing? Looking good. There's Julie today. Dave, did this change your life, yes or no? Oh, absolutely. What else do you know what happened to Julie? Girls got bling. <laughs> now, what's your next question? Does he have a brother, right? <laughs> For a rock that big, I'll go out with him. For God's sakes, look at that thing. So that's a fun way to do treatment, gang. I think the question is, does your husband need dental care? <laughs> is your husband? I love it. He can afford that rock. He can afford some veneers. Bring them on. But that is a fun way to treat somebody. We don't judge people based on their color, size, shape, profession, sexuality, religion, anything. Think about it, gang. You don't go into Walmart and tackle somebody. They walk into your dental office. Aren't they saying I'm interested in buying some level of health care? So to me, you ought to have the audacity to give them the courtesy of listening to them and talking to them and say how healthy you want to get, how soon you want to get there. And that can be a lot of fun. Okay, Uncle Rich said, you got to have the team. You got to be able to communicate. We got to move into technology as well. Technology is a big, big deal. It has changed so much. 
Dave, I started dental school in 1980. What year did you start? 82. So we, we are a similar vintage. Mm -hmm. And I had a buddy of mine, a classmate of mine, come up to me in seminar and said, Mark, I'm doing it just the way they taught me in dental school. <laughs> like, back off, sailor. Not doing anything the way they taught us in dental school. The principles of quality don't change, do they? But man, the materials and the techniques sure do. They change dramatically. Dave, I'm guessing back in the day you were a deadhead. Is that fair to say? Um, a little bit. I was more- I really wasn't, but I was more of an old time rock and roller, but John Perry Barlow was a songwriter for the Grateful Dead and a high tech wonk. He said this amazing expression, in an information economy, attention is the monetary unit. In this fast paced, crazy world we live in, in this information economy, how do you get your patient's attention and show them you have something important to say? <clears throat> Dave, we already established, right? We all see the world the same way, right? Yeah. No, we don't. This picture is old as dirt. I love showing it. Who's seen this before? Dave, do you remember this? Oh, yeah. So I usually, when I'm a live audience, have them call out, what do you see? And some people see a young woman who's looking to the side. Others see a more mature woman. And actually, the first time I showed this to Dave Hornbrook, what do you think he said? What about the lion eating her head? I'm like, thanks a lot, bud. <laughs> Then you find your deadhead. You know who's stoned in the I, audience. I, I, I'm thinking but it's people the lady the with the collapsed person. vertical. It's like, I got to refer to somebody because they don't do dentures. I, I love it, but I, I, I bet you could, you could open that puppy up. <laughs> Tom Friedman says we live in the age of continuous partial attention. Continuous partial attention. You look on the top left, this woman's on her iPhone or iPad or iPod or Crackberry. These two women on the bottom are having a conversation with each other. It's killing me. Dr. Kathy Jamison said these eight magic words that changed my career. 21 years ago, Kathy looked at me and said, Mark, how do you create the sense of urgency? If that speaks to you, friends, write that down, screenshot it in your morning huddle, Monday morning back in your practice. Ask your team today and for the rest of our careers, how will we create the sense of urgency? We have something important to say and the patient should pay attention. Again, I'm not here hawking product. Dave, I know photography is a huge part of your career. It, it grew for mine. If people are slow to get into the photography game, you can start simple. Again, I'm not here hawking product. I had eight operatories. I had eight DigiDot cameras. It's a California company. This is the president of the company, his private cell phone. If anybody doesn't have cameras that they're happy with, you can tell them Dr. Mark referred you and you will get special pricing on this. This is a Iris X80 liquid lens. The quality of the photo mimics an SLR camera. It's really amazing. If you are not using cameras yet, if you say to me, Dr. Mark, I have eight operatories and we have, we have a camera and we move it around. My answer is no, you don't. No, you don't. You're not doing it. You're not documenting before, during and after what's going on. I dare say there's not anybody on this call tonight that has verbal skills strong enough to describe what you see in this picture to a patient the mesial cracking, the buckle cracking, the incisal edge wear, the alloy failing. Without a picture, you're just talking and it's not doing any good. Now, Dr. Dave Hornbrook is one of the most successful dentists in North America. Dave, we're gonna role play real quick. Is that okay? That's fine. This is a high powered attorney in Greensboro who just fired a dentist who said, you need a crown on number 13, upper left second by cuspid. <clears throat> Dave, if you don't have a photograph, or a radiograph and I'm in the chair, how are you gonna sell me, close me, treatment plan me? Well, I'm visual, so I think everyone else is. So I'm gonna take, I have intro cameras in each room. You're gonna see it. I like the way you're thinking. Yes, Trebek, I will take things that didn't happen for 600. Dave's saying, I'm not playing without my camera. And he's right, because here's what Dave is gonna do, or his teammate's gonna take a picture. Now, my colleague in Greensboro looked at this man and said, you need a crown on 13 and the patient fired him. All I did was take this picture and I looked him in the eye. Dave, people have honored me and more so you for our level of case acceptance. I'd love to hear what your verbal skill is on a tooth like this. Mine is I tell the t dental practitioners and teammates to put this picture in front of your patient and look them in the eye and just say, wow. <laughs> you know, in a business negotiation, the first one to speak, loses. 
So I just put that picture up there and just went, wow. He said, what is that? I said, what do you think it is? He said, is my tooth cracked? I said, sir, how can I help you? He said, well, you need to fix it. Our colleague said, you need a crown and got fired. And all I said was, wow. So just a little, little pearl for the teammates watching tonight or young doctors, your verbal skills and being descriptive with your patients, with your camera shots, your tooth has some nice features to it. However, it looks like the rock hits your windshield. Dr. Mark, it doesn't hurt. Well, termites are painless and then your house collapses or the all time classic, your tooth has some nice features to it. However, it's just past its expiration date. So if those verbal skills speak to you, that would be my privilege. Digidoc, again, this is proprietary. It has LUM, L-U-M. It's a transillumination device, which is simply unbelievable. I ask you again, my dear friends, how many of you have verbal skills that are superior to this photo in explaining the sense of urgency to a patient? Now, if you go ahead and treat these teeth and our friends at the dental insurance company, if you are insurance dependent, I'm respectful of that. For my career, I had 32 years in private practice. I did not participate in PPO, HMO plans, and we did not do pre-denials with the insurance company. Dave, I'm sure you don't either. The no. pre-authorizations, we just don't play that game. But if a patient comes back and says insurance didn't cover it, and you've got these photos, you've got the before, during, and after, you have the evidence, which makes it a whole lot more fun. So people have said to me, Dave, I can't get my hygienist to use the camera. My answer to them is look at your hygiene, the hygienist, man or woman, person in your practice and say, I appreciate you. I adore you. As soon as you take a picture, I'll come check you. Yeah. So we did that too. It is a simple. It's kind of interesting is the hygienist, you know, I told my hygienist that I want a picture on the screen before I come in for an exam. Yes, sir. And then it got to be the point where all of a sudden there wouldn't be a picture. And then we had our meeting. They both said, well, you've done all the dentistry. So there's really nothing to show. And I said, so take a picture of the dentistry that I did and create value for that. Say, look at this is the last crown that Dr. Hornberg placed. It looks amazing. It looks like a natural tooth. So, you know, it, it basically what it is, it, it's just capitulating that value that was created when you did the rest of it. I love it. And if your team has been taking photos, I bet you have a pre-op photo to say, you know, it's been two years, but remember what you came in with with that tooth? Oh God, was that my tooth? And remember what Dr. Dave did for you? Yep, he's the best. Thank you. He, I love working for him. Anybody at work looking for a special dentist? Th these seeds are not hard to plant. Um, we have uh, several SLR cameras in the office. This is a Shofu camera, Dave. Have you tried that? I had years ago, and I don't. I use think it, it weighed it, like it's very, very easy for team members, especially. But yeah, that that was my point. Is I found my team with the ring light and the big honking lens, many of them struggled with taking quality photos. If I show a photograph tonight and it's a little blurry, I took it. If it's crisp and clean, my teammates took it. But cross-training is imperative. Everybody's gotta be versed on what you want. This is what DigiDoc trains you. If you say to me, Dr. Mark, we simply do not have time. My loving answer is your mama. You can take 12 quality photos in two minutes if you're planting seeds, if you say to me, I can't do the type of work that you guys do. Again, I'm telling you, Dave and I, I don't think we did this our first year of private practice, comprehensive optimal care. You build up to it, you get experience, you get better verbal skills, but this is a way to build the value. And almost, almost, almost every time the patient is gonna look at you and say, I have never seen this. Mm -hmm. Man, you must be really good. You have all this equipment. <laughs> like, what does that have to do with anything? but it does. Dave, I'm just not smart enough to figure out why this isn't a good idea. If you're doing all, all your veneers, do you cement one at a time, two at a time, four at a time? How do you do it? I do them all at one time. How many curing lights do you have? In my office or one time when I'm curing? If you were cementing eight veneers, 10 veneers, would you just use one light? No, we use three curing lights, just like that. Okay. That... I hold two, my assistant holds the other and she holds the shield. I love it. And I, I cannot tell you how many people go, Dr. Mark, I only have one light per operatory. I'm like, OMG, buy another one. <laughs> they just, and they're like, can you do that? I'm like, so you're doing four occlusals in a row. 
you're etching one, bonding one, filling it, curing it, then etching, bonding, curing, or you do the whole thing. You can practice any way you choose. The next few things I'm showing are ways to be more efficient and more effective. I'm an isolated addict. Um, Dr. Tommy Hirsch, who's a California man, and his brother, Jim Hirsch, who's an engineer, they invented this 25 years ago. I had eight operatories. I had eight Gigidocs, eight operatories, eight isolites. Success leaves clues. This was a formula that worked for me. Um, love them. Buffering of the anesthetic. Dave, did you ever do that? I did when it first came out, when it was kind of a bulky machine. I don't use it now, but people swear by it. So Mick Falkel, who's a dentist and a chemist, another California man, one of your brothers out there, uh, he invented this, which is amazing. Stanley Malamed did this study, which said if you use articane or lidocaine at the 15 minute mark, you're only 67% effective. If you buffer with liquid sodium bicarb, Dr. Falkel has this two-way pen, pulls out 0.9 in the liquid lidocaine, shoots in 0.9 in the liquid sodium bicarb. Your lidocaine shots hurt because the acidity, the pH of the lidocaine is 3.5. It's like lemon juice, it burns but you buffered, it becomes, the pH becomes 7.4, which is the same as water. And at the two minute mark, you're 71% numb. If you aren't even good given a block, at the eight minute mark, you're at 100% effective. So these are some ideas for your practice that can make you work smarter, more efficient, more effective. This is super duper topical. Dave, have you seen that mixture of lidocaine, prilocaine, tetra? I have. Have you tried that? We use, we use EMLA, which is very, very similar. Great. Um, the, yeah, it's it's yeah, great. Right. People freak out over this. The isolate people said to me, Dr. Mark, the, the mouthpieces pieces cost two dollars. I'm like, yeah, and it just cut the time to a procedure 30 to 50 yeah. percent. Well, well, buffering, I mean that that that's three dollars per patient. I'm like, yeah, and you just got an extra hour a day to work. <laughs> it's craziness. So I want us to be of abundance instead of scarcity. So you got the right team, you got the right communication, you've got the right equipment. Now our education, how do we educate our teams? My dear friends, if you think education is expensive, you should try ignorance. You should absolutely try ignorance. And there were times when I was not a very good boss. When I was early in my career, I had been led by men and women who said you rule with an iron fist and that just simply doesn't work. Outside of dentistry, my time with the Dale Carnegie organization changed my life. Dave, did you ever take a Dale Carnegie course? I did not. I did but not. you know, you've heard Dale Carnegie, has the book, How to Win Friends and Influence oh, yeah, People. Absolutely. It's a hundred plus year old material. It's in 80 some countries. It is tried and true. That's Mr. Nigel Alston, my Carnegie coach hero and dear, dear friend. Uh, my big break in the dental speaking world, Dave, came when I spoke at the CDA in Anaheim in April, 1999. I'd done mom and pop seminars and a couple little gigs. And then that was my big break. And in anticipation of that, I signed up to take the Dale Carnegie course. And they also have a two day HIP high impact presentation course where they videotape you doing eight, eight three, three minute seminars, three minute discussions. And the first one you look at it and you're looking down at your feet and you're looking at the sky and you're picking your nose and you're just doing everything but focused on delivering a powerful message. So that was huge for me. I had every teammate in my practice, I paid for them to take Dale Carnegie training. Now that investment's a couple thousand dollars per teammate. Dave, I've had people say to me, Dr. Mark, let me get this straight. You paid $2,000 per person for them to take this training. Well, what happens if they leave? I said, well, what happens if you don't pay for it and they stay? <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, what do you stand for doctors? So you just want to be average. You want to be the best of the best. You want to be distinctive. You want to be life-changing. I invested heavily in my team. What did I get in return? The unbelievable level of love and loyalty and commitment and passion and excellence. So in life, it's got to be win-win or it's no deal. So that was a really cool thing for me. Uncle Rich, who we talked about at the beginning, again, he's, he's an author as well. He wrote this wonderful book, Your Employees Have Quit. They Just Haven't Left engagement in the workplace. Your employees have quit. They just haven't left. So that is a wonderful thing. When I got, saw a book that I liked, I would buy a dozen copies and give it out to the team and say, next month at our team meeting, we're going to talk about this book. So as an organization, as a learning, growing organization, we all read 
Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Zap, Z-A-P-P, The Lightning of Empowerment by Bynum and Cox. Who Moved My Cheese, Millionaire Next Door, Raving Fans, Good to Great by Collins, Creating a Healthy Work Environment by Dr. Kathy Jamison. Start with Why, Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. I talked to my team about this and it just can make a huge difference for young doctors. If they would come to me and say, Dr. Mark, I'd like to work with you. So I would say, cool, I'd love to work with you too. What does your success library look like? And if they say, say what? I'll say, well, thank you very much. I'm not gonna work with men, women, whatever's that aren't committed to growing and learning and improving. And so that's important to me. So I want you just to think about the power of that. They were talking about different books that we read as an organization. Have you had your team read books together? We haven't done that in a long time, Mark, what we used to. But like, like your team, my Dell assistant's been with me almost 28 years. My front office. Outstanding. Four. So, you know, we did all this as we developed as a team. So, you know, we're a family like, you know, you, you talk about your team. And I think it's sad it's when, when they're just employees, right? They're employees and they come and go every two or three years. And um, it, it's, it wastes everybody's time. So this is just a thought as I was making the point that we studied this material together. We would talk about it at a team meeting. Was this selfish? Was this inwardly selfish for me just to improve their performance at work? It's so they would have a happier relationship at home. So they would be a better parent, a spouse, a significant other, a lover, whatever they are, wherever they are in their life at this time. It was me constantly saying, I'm trying to improve you and make you a better person. So in our time that we have left, we're going to just do a couple of cases, if that's okay. Now, it's a little intimidating to show my dentistry to Dave Hornbrook, but that's okay. I know you'll be gentle with me. Dave, why do I love that picture? Because it's about relationships. Uh, this is my hygienist, Lauren, walking her patient back to get her teeth cleaned. This is a senior who was having a little bit of a struggle getting down the hall. And this just shows, I think, a very touching level of love and caring and compassion. So my youngest daughter, Evie, her best friend was Phoebe growing up. Phoebe had two brothers, Isaac and Noah, three kids on main. They're done. Grandma's old, about to die, turns to mom and said, wouldn't it be nice if you had one more child? If you do, I'll pay for college. Mom's, mom swears she missed one pill. Boom, triplets. <laughs> Anybody on the call have six or more kids that you know of? <laughs> Dave, you got your two handsome boys, right? I got my two boys. And I've got my three, my, my son and my two daughters. We'll see them in a little bit. But why do we love this picture? You look at Sylvia on the right. She hadn't quite figured it out. Usually when I would point this out on the West Coast for you, Dave, I would say from the left, it's Bruin, Bruin, Trojan. <laughs> but I can't now because my son-in-law is a Trojan, so fight on. Okay. People have said, whatever happened to those kids? Sylvia hadn't quite figured it out, but there they are graduating middle school. And um, that was the cool thing for me because they have now graduated high school. They're off to college and uh, that I got a chance to be a part of their life. That, that, that is one of the coolest, most impactful things that I had in my career was the privilege of getting to know families, having teammates that stayed with me as long as Dave has had his teammates. Because I'm from the South, this is less impressive perhaps, but I had at least five families where I saw four generations of the family. And uh, that was really cool when you get great grandma, grandma, parent, great grandchild, and, um, and that was a, a lot of, of joy for me. The greatest generation. What do you know about seniors, Dave? They, at, that, at their age, they're just not gonna keep their teeth, are they? Of course they are. Uh, to my dying day friends, I would say, how do you know if you don't ask? Many people say, Dr. Mark, they don't have dental insurance. And I'm saying, <laughs> thank God, they got money. <laughs> they're savers. They're, yeah. they're spoiled, rotten, millennial, great-grandchildren are spenders. But inside these seniors, there's a kid just trying to get out. So this is a fun way to practice, gang, is to try to find the inner child, to get to know your patients, listen to them, love on them, and help them get the smile of their dreams. It's a really fun way to practice. This is Mary Graham. When you read body language, when I try to set up a case, my treatment coordinator would say, give me a smile. This is her smile. Would you suspect something's up? 
Mm -hmm. You appreciate the hair, the clothing, the makeup, the affect, the jewelry. You're not seeing a lot of confidence, are you? My teammate said, give me a smile. She, she's trying to smile. Finally, you take a crowbar, you part, part her lips and kind of go, wow. Dr. Dave, where do we go here, man? <laughs> you look at this, you appreciate there's mesial decay on number two. Three has a fractured MO. You see the crack through the buckle and through the palatal cusp there. Number four, I'm guessing that it makes, looks like four is missing. Five has a PFM crown that's cracked. The incisal ledge of six is cracked, failing composites. Seven is cracked out with the alloy with a crack coming out of it. Composite on eight, nine is crushed to the crust of the tissue. Incisal ledge gone of 10 with a failed composite and an amalgam. You look at the wear on these teeth and you just go, whoa, baby. So if you think back to Dr. Mark's 10 questions, are you gonna see this woman and say, shame on you, you really let your mouth go. What's wrong with you, lady? Is that where you're gonna go with her? Are you gonna say, man, I'm so glad you came in today. Thanks for trusting me to take good care of you, ma'am. How can I help you? Tell me what's going on. Would you agree there's some dramatic changes going on in this smile? The answer is yes. This is not the time to fuss. I said, well, tell me what your last dentist said. When did you last see a dentist? Is that an interesting question for you all? And she said, last week. I said, wow, what do they do? He put, did pin composites on number nine, which immediately broke right off. Dave, when did you last place a pin on a patient? 1986. <laughs> 1986. And what's cool is then they all got endo, but you know, it, it, back in its day, it was an idea whose time has come. We got other stuff in dentistry now, but you look at this poor woman, you look at the amount of wear, the recurrent decay, the recession, the failed dentistry, the vertical cracking. So what question do you want to ask her? Why now? Why Dr. Mark wants you to do the 10 questions is you never know which question is going to create that sense of urgency. Ma'am, why did you come in today? Why now? I'm going to my grandson's wedding. And I want a picture with my grandson and my new granddaughter. Dr. Dave, how bad do I want to knock this out of the park? 100%. I'm dying, man. So what's your next question? When is it? How soon? Is it next week, next month, next year? How fast do I need to move here? And the wedding was soon. In a normal sense with this case, we would have pulled that tooth. We would have perhaps done an implant at her vintage with her health. We might have considered other things. When you see a frozen drink, a frozen juice smoothie, if I say, what time is it? You say smoothie time. It's like hammer time. Dave, this is one of the biggest practice builders of my career. It costs two bucks. In passing, I'd say to a patient, did you have breakfast? And almost always they'd say, well, no, I didn't want to hurl with the impression. I was too nervous. I didn't have time. And I'll say, do you like smoothies? I like guava. What's your favorite flavor? And they'll say strawberry surprise. I'm like, cool. We send a note to the business team. They run to the juice shop a mile away. Come back when I sit the patient up we hand them a smoothie or a milkshake and say, here's a gift from us to you. Dave, how did I end up with 1,200 five-star reviews? I gave the gentlest injections. I was in a relationship. I listened to the patients before I put a tool in their mouth. I called them at night to see, are they okay? We wrote them a thank you note on a nice impressionist card. We got them smoothies. We did these little stinking things that don't really cost you anything, but they make all the difference in the world. So that is a fun way to practice. So there's your before. Boom. How do we do? Looking good. For me, not so bad, right? Yeah. And Dave already has this down. You know how to get 100% case acceptance, young man? Sometimes you got to take one for the team, right? That's it. You do what you got to do to make your numbers. And so I said, Mary Graham, you have got to send me the picture from the wedding. Promise me you'll send me a picture from the wedding with your grandson and your new granddaughter. She said, I promise. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm like, come on, lady. I did all that work. We rushed this case to get it back so you could go to the wedding. And that's the picture you sent me? Didn't you have any fun at the wedding? She said, well, yes. Okay, guess I won't get invited back to real talk again, so that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> Dave, have you had a patient send you a picture like that? No, I haven't. 
I didn't mean like the jumping in the lake. I mean the. Oh yeah. I'm send you a smile. Send you a smile shot, and then they're. I have a patient that about well, we lost a whole year, so it was summer of 2019. It seems like it was six months ago, and she she has a very successful podcast. She's up in LA. She had a huge diastema. And now she sends me these pictures and I see her on Instagram. I see her on Facebook and she's, she's got her lips pursed together. It's like, dude, really? That's why you spent all that money. Teeth, teeth by Hornbrook. <laughs> Very good. So millennials, for the millennials on the call, we actually love you. We appreciate you. There's a statistic. This is the year 2021 by 2030 millennials will have inherited over, over 70 trillion. That's with a T. $70 trillion from their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. Kind of crazy. Dave, you're an old-time rock and roller. So we've established, I hope, that your first year in private practice, you weren't doing 28 veneers on everybody. Is that fair? No, hardly. You, bu you built a practice. You okay. built trust. You built your skill. You studied. You learned. You, were, you had the talent and the ambition, but you kept improving yourself. This is a dance in 1961. It happens to be in England. 18 people showed up. Do you recognize the band? Yeah, is that the Beatles? Happens to be a left-handed guitar player, so you got it. That's 1961. This is Febu February 1964. They went from 18 people showing at a, up at a dance to what, 40, 60, 80 million people seeing them on the Ed Sullivan show, whatever the number was, uh, craziness. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting you show the Beatles. So I just heard on the, the NPR as I was driving to work today, they were talking about the bands that earned the most money in 2020. No, this is 2000, the first six months of 2021, right? Eagles was number one, but the Beatles were number three. The Beatles eight million dollars the first six months just in downloads and streaming through the internet eight million dollars 50 years later 60 years later it's crazy you know so what's my teaching point here you got to start somewhere you got to build and don't presume dave in my practice it didn't happen overnight we did a ton of good education we had coaches we had trusted mentors we screwed things up royally and then fixed it and made it right. So Dave, being an old time rock and roller, I love asking millennials in the audience, since it's just you and I, what bird did I ask for here? What bird did I ask Sarah Bell to hand me? 45. How many? Two. That's, I asked for a 245. <laughs> I showed this and the millennials are like, what's that? I'm like, that's a, it's a record and it has a B-side and there's a song on it. It's really cool. My daughter years ago found my album collection from Chapel Hill, but stuck back in a closet. She said, daddy, cool, big CDs. I'm like, no, honey, no, 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 no. My, Dr. Erwin Becker, one of my heroes and mentors from the Pank Institute said to me, Mark, the reason most people never accepted optimal care dentistry is that no one ever offered it to them. The reason most people never accepted optimal care dentistry is that no one ever offered it to them. My dear friends, I want you to have the audacity to ask. I want you to recognize that men and women like the superstars of dentistry, like a Dave Hornbrook or a Billy Dorfman or the different people that were so successful in dentistry, they built their careers, they built their practices, they studied, they got coaches and they had no fear of failure. They offered patients the privilege of receiving the very finest dentistry we have to offer with no fear of failure. And you know, Mark, it's going to happen. Let me interrupt this you here. Kind of, say that. So you, please, you may not know the answer time. to this, but those that have been through my courses absolutely know the answer to this. Do you happen to know what my favorite, favorite quote of all time is? You haven't seen two things happen when you ask and ask one when you don't. Similar. It's actually, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. That's Wayne Gretzky. Thank you, Wayne Gretzky. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, man, I love it. Many times we haven't asked, you know, a patient on their health history form, you know, you may have a question, that, is there anything you'd like to change about your smile or front office may ask them and they say no, especially men. And 
they have an ugly PFM on their front tooth and we just kind of skirt right by that because radiographically it's okay and clinically it's okay. And I think just to sit down with a patient and say, you know how long have you had this crown? You know, it's gray a little bit up near the gum line. Does it bother you at all? And if they say no, we move on, right? But maybe no one ever asked them that question, <laughs> right? So, you know, typical scenario, again, a, a man comes in and we have a question on our health history form that says, if you could wave a magic wand, is there anything you'd like to change about their smile? And women will fill that in. And this is not a chauvinistic statement by any means, but women will fill that in. They're usually used to talking with a maybe hairdresser or, or salon person about things they want to change. And men were not always that comfortable, especially, you know, in the, in men in their middle age. And so they may leave it blank, right? So he has an ugly PFM. To me, a PFM, like the crown, maybe that you're going to show, but the crown you showed me earlier, to me, that's no longer want dentistry. If a patient of mine has a PFM on a front tooth, that's need dentistry. Listen, I don't want my patients to go out around town with a PFM on a front tooth and tell people that I'm their dentist. I, I just don't want that. I love it. Right? Who's your dentist? Dr. Yeah. Hornbrook. Yeah. Well, let me write that down and make sure I don't go, right? Um, so, I mean, typical scenario, I, I, and I'm very visual, right? And so I think the rest of the world is visual. And so I would hand them a mirror. I, I still like a mirror versus a screen because I think we've gotten too far away from close contact, right? And if they're looking in the mirror and I've got my hand on their shoulder or I'm holding the mirror, you know, I like that personality aspect of it. So I'll say, does this bother you at all? And, and they'll say, no, it's fine. I say, you know what, Mark? It looks okay clinically. I'm looking at the x-ray. It's fine here. But that's technology that we used to use. We don't really do that anymore. It has metal and that's why there's a little bit of gray. If there's any time that you would like to change that, we're doing some really cool things and I'm here for you. Then I finished the exam. I would say 85% of the time before I'm done with that exam, that same person that said, no, it doesn't bother me, says, talk to me again about this front tooth. You know, they're doing the diagnosis, right? I, I love it. You know what? It's fine. My, my one thought is once you put the mirror down, the image is gone. So that's where I love the intro camera photo right in front of them. And then you leave, the hygienist spends time with them. And every time they look up, there's that honker of a tooth looking at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I love it, love it, love it. So this is Jenna. We're gonna have Dr. Dave help us work through this. That's exactly what we're talking about, PFM dentistry on eight and nine. This is a brilliant young woman, attractive young woman. You look at these centrals. Think back to your golden proportion again, gang. When you look at this, as I go back and forth, the proportionality 1.6, 1.0.6. Is there any way in the world for Dave and I just to recrown eight and nine with an all porcelain crown and get a gorgeous, correct smile? Proportionally, there's no way you can't do it. But what I want to do is have her talk to me and describe what she sees. So asking those 10 questions, you get to the right history. I want to know how old are those crowns? If she says they were put in last week, you could say, wow, someone worked really hard at making you that ugly. You can't say that. Well, how long have those been in there? 20 years. You go, wow, somebody worked really hard. That Boy, those have serve you beautifully, haven't they? They've got some nice features to them. However, they're just past their expiration date. Would you like to know what modern dentistry can do for you? So this is the deal with Jenna. I went through the 10 questions. Who can we thank for referring you? I went online, saw you had 1,200 five-star reviews. Jenna's a nurse, so is her sister. I said, ma'am, how can I help you? I hate my smile. The obvious thing, dental men and women, is to say, well, that's because you got those nasty PFMs. Don't do that. Say, tell me more. My front teeth look terrible. How does it make you feel? I hate them. I don't want to smile anymore. You know, tell me about yourself. I got married two weeks ago. I got these teeth done right before the wedding. I was like, <laughs> wow. Did your dentist show you these before he cemented <clears throat> them? And she said, no. And I said, what did he say to you when you said you hate him? And he, she said, he said, we can't fix them for five years because of the insurance. My dear friends, where did we lose control of the game here? 
where do we let a triangle happen when we are in a passionate relationship one-on-one -on -one with our patients and we allowed a third party to come in and ruin things? You don't have to play that game. We can't fix them for five years because of the insurance. So she fired her childhood dentist, drove an hour and a half to come see me. So where's the insurance question? It's not. Why now? Because I hate my smile. What's the time frame? I want them fixed. What are your long-term goals? I want a beautiful smile. Who else has input? I make my own decision. Do you have a budget? No. Can I make payments? What's the answer? Sure. You got in our office, we got three ways to save money. You prepay a week before you get a 5% bookkeeping courtesy on a big case that David and I may do. That's a dramatic savings. Mm -hmm. Also, people that prepay show up. <clears throat> Day of the race, use your charge card to get the airline miles or our financial partner care credit. I'll say, you tell me how many dollars a day is comfortable for you. When asking my seminars, Dave, how much do you charge for a crown? People call out all sorts of numbers and I'm like, no, you don't. People will say 1,200. I'm like, no, you don't. It's not 1,200. It's $100 a month for a year. It's $25 a week. It's $3 a day. It's a cup of Starbucks a day for a year. If you're having trouble talking fees, break it down into something palatable. No matter what you charge, it's too much money. So you may as well charge a fair fee for excellence. When would you like to be finished? Yesterday, we can do that. Some time and we're off and rolling. And this is a great time to be a dentist. One of the coolest things, I love showing this. She went back to her childhood dentist and got her study models that he still had. Dr. Dave, what can I do with these study models that will knock her socks off? You do Any a thoughts? This is why he's doing the podcast and I'm his guest. He's so smart. <laughs> Dave, have you had your lab do wax up with pink tissue? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Check this out, folks. If you've done it 50 times, how many times did the patient say yes? Essentially every time. 100% of the time. This, this was, I have never had the lab do pink tissue and had the patient say no. When we show them a stone model, it's not very lifelike. Now you may say to me, Dr. Mark, with digital printing, you don't have to do the wax ups. I get it, but there's something, it's a little old school. This is one of the great moments of my diagnosis, treatment planning, case presentation life. All I did to Jenna was I handed her the wax up and I looked at her, Dave, what do you think I said? What did I say to her? You let her enjoy them. <laughs> She took one look at it. I just sat there, looked at her. She looked at me. I looked at her. She looked at me. She said, this is exactly what I want. What did I say? Yeah. And you know, with, Summertime. with printed models now, the lab can print soft tissue. The lab can print pink soft tissue? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love it. And it'll fit right against a tooth color model like that. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Fantastic. I said, when would you like to be finished? She's like, now, can you do it today? I'm like, we can do that. She said, can my sister come back and watch? Dave, do you have patients come back and watch you that they, they have a guest to come and watch you? Yeah, all the time. What could happen with them watching you work? Are you taking new patients? Can I go next? Can I go next? <laughs> I love it. So there's your before, major drum roll and boom. Tissue is still a little angry, but I think that was a dramatic difference. Oh, yeah. So yeah. because I took good care of Jenna, I got to see her daughter, her sister, Lauren, and her mama, and her papa, Mr. Happy. That one referral <laughs> became the whole family. And the grand youngins. And that just, that, that's when it's a joy to do our type of dentistry. When you become part of people's lives, when you impact their lives, when you have that privilege it isn't something that I take lightly. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of work, but this is all about relationships. So my generation, the baby boomers, Dave, you, you just qualify, don't you? I just qualify. You're the, you're the end of the baby the boom. 1946 to 1964. I got you by a couple of years, but my wife technically is of the age of a baby boomer, but she's clearly not of our generation. <laughs> How do you characterize us? Is that a compliment or not? Is that a problem? No, I said, is that a compliment? <laughs> I think it's a compliment because we're going to die quicker than they will. But we can, tend to be competitive, hardworking, independent, passionate, work-centric. Um, 
I loved my career and I just love this picture because I kind of it kind of typifies many of our dental colleagues. You can take all these courses and go study shoulder to shoulder with Dave Hornbrook and go back to work and do the same thing you've always done and then you've wasted everybody's time. The power just keep digging, keep pumping, keep pushing, keep fighting your way through. There are a lot of diamonds and rubies and pearls that are just really close. The thing is, if Dave and I can do it, anybody can do it because somebody did it before us and you all will do it after we do it. If you trust the process, if you study and you work and you read and you get coaching, <clears throat> you spoil your team rotten, great things will happen. Hey, Mark, the truth is doing wanted you to go back. They wanted to see the after. One more time. Can you just real quick? You kind of skip through it. Look great. There we go. Yeah, that's life changing. If, if anybody has a thought on this, my initial question to you, can we just crown eight, nine? Proportionally, you cannot and get this type of result. Now that's me just doing seven through 10. Dave, would you have thought of four to 13? No, no, I think you did a great job and I think you did it right by doing four. You think about that word appropriate. What is appropriate for your patient at this time in their life? This is a young mm -hmm. woman if Dave and I do cosmetic dentistry and she's in her late, mid to late twenties and our work lasts, you hope. She's got nice, nice shade of teeth and yeah. I think it, the, once the tissue settled in, it was even more gorgeous. So, so somebody else that. asking, and this is where you, you, you and I differ just a little bit. Someone asked Bring about it proportions. And if you go and look at golden proportions, I mean, you said exactly right. A two dimensional picture the laterals would have a value of one. The centrals would be 1.62, the canine 0.62 of the lateral, the first premolar 0.62 of the canine. I went back, now that's considered the golden proportion. I went back and looked at smiles and you know, obviously aesthetics is subjective. Um, and the smiles that jumped out, whether I had done them, someone else had, whether God had made them, is I like the centrals a little wider. And so as I look back, I like the centrals to be about 1.8 of the lateral. I just like a little, especially on women, just a little bit more dominant. But even me saying 1.8, you could have not achieved that with two on her. I mean, there's just no way. I mean, you did the right thing with four. And that was, you did this patient a huge service because the veneer, the veneer preps on the laterals were almost non-prep. I mean, you just, you probably removed 0 0.3, 0 0.5 millimeters at the most conservative. I mean, it, it's, a, you did a really nice job in this case. And a key looking at this is as you go distally, you could argue there that the number three is kind of sucked in, but the buccal corridor is pretty nice. Yeah. So when you fill this out again, was this appropriate for this woman? Yes or no. I think it was very appropriate. And I appreciate that going forward into the, our baby boomers. You never know the impact you have on others' yeah. life. The date is June. The year is 2012. This is Vicki, one of my all-time favorite patients. I adore her. She comes to see me. Dave, the wheels start turning, don't they? Absolutely. She's been to dentist after dentist after dentist. And she saw a dentist who said, I'm going to veneer your front four teeth. Is that going to achieve an excellent smile? There are some dramatic wear issues. The key to this case, as you just, again, when you don't know where to start, take a nice photo, draw some lines, look at your midline, look at the incised ledges, just start to get in your mind. Can with this case, looking at these, can we just, re can we veneer seven through 10 and get a gorgeous smile? You can't do it. So moving forward, you go through Dr. Mark's 10 questions. The why now question, she said, I'm going to my 35 year high school union. I haven't seen my best friend in high from high school in 35 years and I want to make her throw up. I said, that's a new one on me, chief concern, make my best friend throw up. Okay, I'm gonna try to work with you on that. Unbelievable. So we're off to the races. You can do your, with your digital printing now, you can do your models. Old school, you get upper lower alginate, CR bite, let's wax it up, let's see what's possible. That's my periodontal plastic surgeon superstar, Dr. Neil Lutens from Greensboro, North Carolina. If anybody 
anywhere in the Southeast United States is looking for the finest periodontist in the world. Neil has done some unbelievable work for our practice. For me, Dave, and you probably do the same thing. I try to have the dental assistant that's assigned to the case do it from start to finish. Do you do that? Absolutely. Somebody comes in mid case. Well, why'd you pick that? What's this bonded on with? Did we communicate with the lab? What's the temperament? Are financial arrangements made? Does Dr. Lutens know about this? So I got treatment coordinator, lead CDA superstar, specialist. Dave, does it help for me to call my periodontist and say crown lengthen four to 13? Well, it helps. Crown length and what? It's definitive. Crown length and what? What are you shooting for? You want your centrals 10.5, 11.2. What's an ideal central, Dave? Depends. Yeah. What's the lip line? What's the smile line? What's the, the whole, what's the appropriate thing? So Dr. Neal is going to see her. This was on my birthday, which actually is Saturday. Dave, don't get me anything too expensive. Same thing I got you <laughs> for your birthday. I appreciate so that. I'm sure this is Neil violating all sorts of HIPAA, OSHA, and everything when he did this. So here's post-crown lengthening. Do we have some room to work now? We got some length now to do something really pretty. So we're moving forward. This is your before. The 35-year reunion is 48 hours away. And I said to Vicki, give me a smile. She's got a massive abscess on seven and eight. I'm like, oh my God, I have ruined this woman. I thought I was gonna die. Here she is and she's abscessed seven and eight. I got to run her across the street to my endodontist to get the teeth rooted. I thought I've ruined this woman. Here's the next day. The tissue's still a little friable there. Now to my dying day with high-end cosmetics, I would say to you in the presence of greatness with Dave, consider doing two teeth, four teeth, eight, 10, or 12. Almost always, if you just do the front six, you get bit in the butt. Am I right? Yeah, we, we have a saying, four, eight, or 10. I love it. So I'm, I'm a little more, I say two, four, eight, 10, 12. This is when I did six on her. And I think it really worked because her buccal corridor was full. Again, her tissue still healing, post crown lengthening, post cementation. The <clears throat> reunion is a couple hours away. Here she is smiling post endo. Is that a beautiful smile? Dr. Dave, what do you think? I like it. I like it. I think it was gorgeous. And here's the shot from the union with her best friend who turned to her and said, you dyed your hair, you got Botox, <laughs> you got a pluck pluck, you got colored contacts, you got a nose job and you whitened your teeth. And she said, yes, I whitened my teeth with porcelain, but that's nobody's business. So I love this case. I appreciate that. That's the year 2012. Here's a two year follow up. There's an eight year follow up. That's a nine year follow up question for the audience tonight. Why did Dave and I yell at you about photography? You got to take before, during and after photos. Would this case have been as interesting as all I had was here's the veneers. Imagine this woman had ugly front teeth that it doesn't do it. You've got to have the quality photos. You build a, light, a library. If somebody comes to see Dave, he has men and women flying from all over the world. He didn't have to reinvent the wheel. He can say, here's the last five men or women that came in and had smiles similar to yours. You're a lot younger and thinner and better looking, but here's similar smiles to what you have. You pick the one that you want. That, that's the gift of our type of dentistry going forward. You don't merely want to be the best of the best. You want to be considered the only one who does what you do. And again, I appreciate the privilege of being on this show and being with you, Dave. This is Kathy, one of my all-time favorite patients. I adore her and her hubby, Steve. Kathy teaches French at the local community college. Her great joy is to go to Paris every summer. Do I? Hey, do you speak French? I only know a few yeah. swear words. That's it. That's, that doesn't help us today. <laughs> um, I, I spoke in Montreal to a thousand French Canadians. You've spoken there. Mm -hmm. They have translators yeah. uh, standing by. Everybody's got their headphones on. Kathy wrote my introduction in French in transliterated English. So I took the stage and said, Bonjour, mes amis, comment ça va? Quoi de neuf? Je m'appelle Marc. Nous avons un problème. Je ne vais pas les français. 
which roughly translates to good morning, my friends, what's happening? My name is Mark. We have a problem. I don't speak French. The place went nuts. Your audience didn't tonight. That's okay. <laughs> they are. Kathy is in They're going us. nuts. You just hear it. One hour during her month long trip, her first hour there, hands in her pockets, she trips in the subway, face plants, cracks her front teeth. The year is 2000. She's knocked off the incised ledge of six, seven, eight, nine, ten. She is hysterical. She's back at the Paris airport for the millennials on the call. Don't get upset here. There were no cell phones. So I'm on a landline at our state dental meeting at Myrtle Beach, <clears throat> speaking to her husband in Greensboro, North Carolina, to Kathy in Paris, France, a three-way phone call. After one hour in Paris, she's going back to the airport to fly home, hysterical. Dave, what do you say? I, I felt like Daniel Day-Lewis, last of the Mohicans. I will come find you. I said, as soon as you're back in the States, I will come find you. Tina, my super duper star assistant, instead of going home and seeing her gorgeous daughter or her husband who looks like Garth Brooks, Tina came with me to the office that Saturday afternoon. Kathy comes in, she's got her daughter with her. Her daughter is weeping, Kathy is weeping. Her husband's there, he is stomping around the office. It's like a Fellini movie. People are running around crying and screaming and going nuts. <laughs> Tina and I just bonded her front teeth back together till we could get through the weekend. That was kind of cool. Monday morning, we get this gorgeous gift basket that says, dear Tina, because chopped liver did nothing, right? Tina got the gift basket, but that's okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you for going above and beyond on your Sunday afternoon. So that's kind of cool. Back in the day, Dave, this is 21 years ago. We didn't have the same provisional materials that we have now. I had the lab make a sculpture fiber core provisional. Remember that stuff? Oh, yeah. And it was gorgeous. And so that was her provisional that she wore. She went into therapy. This accent so crushed her. <clears throat> Sent her to my endodontist to get root canals on the front teeth. Dave, you're more of a materials man than I am. I believe this was Empress, but I think that was really pretty. It's really pretty. So that's the year, now it's 2001. That's a six month post-op, but you look at this and I got the thumbs up. She started crying, she's weeping, she's gasping. She says, oh my God, oh my God, I'm complete again. For the last month I felt incomplete. Now I'm complete again. Dave, I didn't get a gift basket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I got this letter that I carried me with me on my seminars for the next 20 years that said, Dr. H, thank you, thank you, thank you, making me want to smile again, simply stated you are the best. When I had my accident in Paris, just hearing your voice on the phone across the ocean comforted me more than you'll ever know. Your reassurance and confidence gave me strength when I took that horrible flight back home. You told me I'd be as good as new, and you were right. These letters, Dave, they mean more than any amount of money we ever got paid for dentistry. Don't you agree with me? Absolutely. The Absolutely. privilege of getting to make a difference in somebody's life like that. So that's a 10 year follow up. I'm going to interrupt you again. That's a, that's a great case. And I think, I think she's better than, than she was. Um, so what we've done, and maybe you've done this as well, you know, we've eliminated the sports illustrated and the highlight and the people magazine, in our reception area. We only have before and after books. And then we have two books, two leather bound books that have just our thank you notes. Oh man. Right. And so we asked for those too. Remember you miss 100% of the shots that you don't ask. So if a patient says that was unbelievable, I may say, you know, it would be awesome if other patients could sense what you what you felt today. Would you mind Love it. back on your letterhead or whatnot? So I'd rather have my patients in my reception area. I would rather them have leaf through all these thank you notes and testimonials that are handwritten or sometimes typed on a letterhead versus reading about the Kardashians, <laughs> quite frankly. I think it's, it's brilliant. I, I love the verbal skill they're saying particularly when they're happy, mm -hmm. would you do me a favor? Would you honor me? Yeah. Would you well, we used to have to seconds? do that before, before there was Google and Yelp reviews, right? <laughs> because yep. you know, we didn't it's have It's nice to have them online, but man, to have those handwritten notes, <clears throat> it's, it's just, I, I cherish this to this day. This was 21 years ago. Here's a 10 year follow-up. That's awesome. 13 years, almost to the day, number 10 pops off. Tina swears I looked at her and said, do you want me to fix them one at a time as they all fall off? And I, that doesn't sound like me, does it? <laughs> so we redid her smile and I think that looked a little bit better. 
So that's a 13 year follow up. That's a 17 year follow up from the accident. I love showing this picture, Dave, because I used to say after 17 years, I'm still caring for Kathy and I'm still working for Tina. And um, <laughs> that is the gift. Young doctors on the call, if you're going to take your photography, if you've got a teammate that has done this case the whole way through, they want they want to build their portfolio too. So that's the last shot we take every time is the, the dental assistants cheek to cheek with their patients that they work so hard on. The fact is they spent more time with the patient than you did. So I think that's just a gift and a courtesy. Did you do There's teeth? Kathy back. Did you do teeth? You know what? I call those teeth by hymen. All I did is whiten them. Oh, they're beautiful. They're gorgeous. You know how, you know how many veneer cases Tina sold me? Just, they, they would come in and say, I want Tina teeth. <laughs> and you said, I can do that. I said, I can do that. These hands of steel. My dear friends, continue education without action is just entertainment. I need about five more minutes and we're going to wrap up here. We'll finish a couple of minutes early. I hope this has been intriguing and entertaining for you all. But if you go back to work tomorrow or Monday morning and do the same thing you've always done, you can have wasted my time and your time. I don't like to waste my time. When Dave asked me to do that, it is a great gift. There's only about 50,000 other people he could have asked to come on the show. And he asked me. I think it was sort of the point counterpoint. Let's show you the before you go to study with Hornbrook and what the after could be. But I appreciate this. For the young men and women on the call today, I challenge you. I want you to start taking these pictures with your patients. There's a common theme. When I announced that I was selling my practice to go teach at the dental school at Chapel Hill, I started taking these selfies with my patients. The top left is a professor from a university, then a bank teller, then a nurse. There's the ex-wife. Um, there's my best friend from ninth grade who played for the Lakers and the Pistons. College professor on the second row, another college professor, dog trainer, businessman, clerk at a store. The bottom left is a postal carrier. The guy with the beard I'm kissing, one of my best friends, a uh, homemaker, nurse, and then two college professors. I would love somebody in the thread to put, what do all of those patients have in common? Give me a guess how long they were patients of Dr. Mark. Somebody put it in the thread, please. You're right, this is a quiet group. That's okay. 15 Dr. years. Dave, you try again, 15's a good guess, try again. 10 plus, so that's probably good. 50, Come on. 25, 20, 25, 25, 20 plus, 23. Yeah. I love it. Appreciate you all. Every <laughs> man and woman that you see were patients of mine for 30 years. No one more. did for 30. God bless them. This is my challenge to the young men and women on with <clears throat> us tonight. I want you to look 30 years down the road. 30 years down the road, I'll be dead. Dave will still be working. But <laughs> these people put their love and faith and trust in me to let me care for generations of their families. This is when it's not work. You just come in and hugging people and talking smack. That's my goal for you all. Again, when we got the announcement went out that Dr. Mark is going to be teaching at Chapel Hill, patients came pouring in for one more treatment, one more something. And Luke is one of them that came in. I first saw Luke in 1986, he and his wife. This is October. This was a couple weeks before I left private practice in December. And he said, Dr. Mark, I'll never forget you. And I said, man, I love you guys. I'm hugging him. And I said, I'll never forget you and your wife, Kimmy, and your beautiful daughters. And he said, no, I'll never forget you. And I'm like, I'll never forget you too. He said, you don't remember, do you? And I was like, oh God. I said, I, I know, I, what do you mean? I, I'll never forget you guys. He said, you don't remember the day I came into your office. I'd just been to Wake Forest Medical School well, they told me I had an inoperable brain tumor and get my affairs in order, I'm about to die. And he said, you got mad, you ran out of the room, you called Chapel Hill, you called Duke University, you got me into Duke neurosurgery. And they cut the tumor out and I healed. I got to see my daughters graduate high school and college and walk my daughter down the aisle and do the daddy daughter dance and now I'm a grandpa and I am just crying and he's crying and everybody's going nuts in the office. That's the gift of our type of dentistry gang. That's the gift of intentional relationship-based dentistry. If you have the privilege of that with people, 
never you really don't have to work another day in your life that is the gift for us and it is the emotion that creates value i so appreciate being with my tar heel warriors these are my students at unc the first year dental students and hygiene students they started with covid our pictures of them beginning at dental school they're all separated with masks and fins and snorkels on and this is the first time this entire group got to noogie together like this i can't wait to see them Again, I love the privilege, Carolina dentistry. It is the best in the world. I believe it. Dave, you know who that is? I can't see it. I got the chat thing over it. A little JT. Uh, oh, oh that's Wood. right. I just looked at pictures. Jack Wood. Now, I, I like James Taylor, man. I listen to He's him. He's the best. Carolina, in my mind, it's our national anthem. And would you agree with me that these are two of the most gorgeous children you've ever seen in your entire life? That's King Samuel on the left, my brown eyed girl, Daniel Rose on the right. You blink one more time, there's Evie Michelle. She looks more like Dr. Hornbrook than me. Thanks a <laughs> lot, buddy, drilling down I-40. But you blink <clears throat> and you blink again and you realize that life does move on. So that was my little mush who then I blink one more time and in our backyard Labor Day, she got married. This Labor Day, we have a 300 person wedding happening. My dear friends, it's not too late, but it's later than you think. There's not a man or woman on this call tonight that can't be part of something special, something distinctive and make a profound difference in people's lives, in your patients' lives, your teammates' lives and your own as you wake up every morning knowing you're doing important, meaningful work. These are my guys. Now, this is where we used to stay at the beach when the kids were in diapers. We were there this past January. I just appreciate that privilege and our buddy is back, but now he's been to a Mark Hyman, Dave Hornbrook seminar, and he's learned to let go of those limiting beliefs, let go of those sweets, pull his hand out of that coconut, cut the cord, and he walks off with a coconut full of sweets as you all will leave tonight, I hope, with a bunch of really cool ideas to apply to your practice Monday morning. I sincerely appreciate your attention and time. Thank you very much. No, oh, Mark, you're awesome. You got some amazing, amazing uh, accolades from the, from the listeners. That, that was awesome.